Amen. So we're continuing on in the book of 1 Timothy. And of course, 1 Timothy 3 is probably a real familiar chapter. If we've been in church very long, we've probably uh, heard this uh, chapter preached or have certainly uh, read it and are aware of the qualifications. Is that really what it's, uh, this chapter is about? It's about the qualifications for being a pastor, the quali uh, qualifications for being a deacon. And, and kind of like last week, it kind of gives you the reason why at the end. We remember last week, uh, the reason, the, the main crux of that chapter was that, uh, that, that there's one mediator between God and men, you know, and that's why uh, we, we, that Paul exhorted us to first of all pray and supplicate and, and to do all those things that we saw in 1 uh, Timothy 2 because of the fact that there is one mediator between God and men who have all men to be saved. And it kind of ties it in there at the end where he kind of gives us that same reason is that, you know, God was manifest in the flesh. You know, why is it that we have qualifications? Why is it that God is a God of order who cares about the way things are done in the house of God, who cares about who's running the house of God, and that we are behaving ourselves as we ought to in the house of God. Why is that even important? Well, it's because of the fact that God was manifest in the flesh. You know, that's kind of the emphasis there on the end. We have to be reminding us constantly, the reason why we're doing all these things is because we, we serve the true and living God. So these aren't just things that are just made up for no reason. You know, God has a purpose behind all these things. And uh, it starts out there, of course, saying, this is a true saying, if a man desire the office of a bishop, he desireth a good work. So, of course, you know, bishop isn't a term we use a lot here today. You know, it's synonymous with the word, uh, it's synonymous with the word, you know, elder or pastor would be another word that we're more familiar with. But these all mean the same thing. They can all be used interchangeably. You could talk about a bishop, an elder, or a pastor. It's all the same person. It's the pastor of the church. And he's saying here that, that if a man desire the office of a bishop, he desireth a good work. And what he's saying is that, or showing us anyway, you know, contrary to a lot of popular teaching and belief, is that the call to be a pastor or a bishop is not an external one. It's not one that you're going to, you know, wake up one morning and, and you know, throw back the shades and God's going to speak to you through a beam of light that comes through or, you know, all these crazy things that people come up with that they say they were called to the ministry. That God just put a calling on their life. You know, you might have just had some bad pizza the night before. I mean, who knows what it is? You know, but here's it, what it sh is showing us is that it should come from inside. It should be something that's internally. That if a man desire, you know, if it's something that's coming from you, that you should want that. And I've heard some people say, well, God puts that desire there. And you know, I, I'm not going to necessarily say that's wrong or argue with that. But here's the thing about that is if somebody says, well, I know I'm supposed to be a pastor because I want to be one, you know. And they'll say, that's how I know God's calling me. Well, some people want to be pastors for the wrong reasons. You know, or, or, they're, or they'll let that desire override the fact that they don't meet some of these qualifications. And that happens all the time. So <coughs> really what I'm showing us is, I, I think it's a lot more matter of fact than a lot of people. It's not this mystical thing that everyone makes it into. I think the call to be a bishop or a pastor or an elder is something that a man desires. Why? Because he desireth a good work. He understands what that is. He understands uh, what the position is, what it involves, what it entails, and he desires that. He says, you know, I want to preach the word. I want to help people. I want to reach communities with the gospel of Christ. That's what he wants to do. And he understands that, you know, that it's work that's involved there. And so it's, it's, it's important that the desire is there, but it also it has to make sure it's there for the right motives. It has to be there for the right reasons. Because if you would turn over to 1 Peter chapter 5, and when you get to, some, to 1 Peter 5, just keep a bookmark there. We're going to come back to 1 Peter a little bit later. But in 1 Peter chapter 5, you know, we'll see that you know, it's good to desire the office of a bishop, but we ought to make sure that we're desiring it for the right reasons, that our motives are correct. It says here in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 1, the elders which are among you, again, see, that's elders, that's that word that's being used interchangeably with bishop and, and pastor. The elders which are among you I exhort, who am also an elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ and also a partaker of the glory that shall be revealed. Feed the flock of God which is among you, taking the oversight thereof. So that's the job right there, feeding the flock. You know, opening up the Word of God, preaching the Word of God, teaching people things out of the Word of God. And he says, taking the, sight, uh, the oversight thereof, not by constraint. You know, and that's an important thing. A lot of people don't consider this sometimes. You know, and I've even had to check myself on this, is that I don't, people don't go into the ministry just because somebody else wants them to. You know, whether it be uh, whoever that is. You know, sometimes, you know, especially when we're involved in, in this movement, you know, there's a lot of people out there that desire a church like this one, you know, like Faithful Word. They want that. 
So when they see a guy coming up through the ranks at this church or churches like this, they, start to put, they can start to put pressure on that individual. I mean, I've known people that have come to Faithful Word and approached such individuals and say, will you come to such and such a town and be our pastor? You know, and the guy, the guy was nowhere near qualified. You know, but at the time gave in, said, yeah, I'll do it. You know, but why, would, why are we doing that? Just because somebody else wants us to go do it? You know, and, I, and I've had to make sure that I don't fall into that trap. Because here's the thing, it, 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 you see the need, you have a burden for that place, you have a burden for those people, and that's good, and that's the right motive. But is that really what you want to do? Are you just being constrained by somebody else, or is it something you really want to do uh, for yourself and for them, of course? You know, Because being a pastor, that's a big decision. That's huge. I mean, you're talking about, you know, I especially if you're going to have to be bivocational, you're talking about bringing on a lot of extra stress into your life you know I've not I haven't done it you know but from what I've seen a little bit as the deacon and and having been able to observe pastors over the years is that it seems like it's a lot of work right. and uh, it, it's a big decision to make especially if you're gonna say well I'm gonna move to another part of the country you know I'm just gonna uproot my family I'm gonna go to another part of the country and I'm just gonna put down roots there and hopefully all these people that are saying they're gonna come to church are, are gonna come to church you know, so it's a big decision. As we got to make sure we're not going to be constrained in that. We're doing it for the right motives. That it's coming from within. He says, not by constraint, but what? Willingly. Because we want to do it. Not because the wife wants you to do it. You know, you say, has that happened? Yeah, that happens. Well, my husband, he just needs to do this. And she'll start needling him. You know, you should really do it. You should really do it. And they will, they will, that happens. And I'm telling you something. That person is getting into it for the wrong reason. You know, or they just, it, what, it, it, whatever reasons there are, you have to make sure it's the right one to feed the flock of God, to do the work that's involved. Not for filthy lucre. There's a big one. Does that happen? Man, all the time. I mean, they, how do you see all, the false prophets everywhere that are just making millions of dollars? Filthy lucre, preaching things which they ought not for filthy lucre's sake. And he says, but of a ready mind. You know, someone who's actually thinking soberly about what it is they're endeavoring to do and understanding what they're getting themselves into. A ready mind, one who's ready to take on the work, to preach the word of God, to do what's involved. Now, keep something there in 1 Peter 5. Again, we'll, we're going to come back to that a little bit later. But he goes on there and he says, uh, in, uh, actually, just stay right where you're at. Uh, he says in Ephesians chapter 4, you know, that the, desi you know, the desire should be to do a good work. And it says in Ephesians 4, And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and, some, and teachers for what? For the perfecting of the saints. You know, to make the saints whole, to make them to complete, to be a, a whole man for the work of the ministry. You know, that's why God has given us pastors. That's why God has given us teachers and evangelists and these, and these, type, these different offices. And so that we, the saints, can be built up in Christ, that we can be admonished, that we can be exhorted, that we can be challenged and that we can do the work of the ministry, that the work gets accomplished. I mean, ultimately, that's the goal here. You know, along the way, everything we do should be so that we can accomplish the work of the ministry. You know, and along the way, of course, we have to deal with things, we have to work things out, but ultimately, we should always have our eye on the goal. You know, and our goal here in Tucson is that map over there. Amen. You know, and it's not just the actual physical shading in of that map. All that re map represents is the work that we're trying to do. That's the goal of knocking every door in this city and preaching the gospel. And uh, that's a big work. And we, that's why we need to have these positions. <coughs> it says, uh, Paul exhorted Timothy in 2 Timothy, watch thou in all things, endure afflictions. You know, you're going to be a pastor, you're going you're gonna to have to endure some afflictions. Things aren't always going to go right. Things aren't always going to be perfect. There's going to be fightings. There's going to be persecutions. There's going to be difficulties. But he says, you know what? Endure that. And what does he say? Do the work of an evangelist. Make full proof of thy ministry. Now, what is doing the work of the evangelist? That's what we do. That's what some of us just got done today, right? We went out for an hour and knocked doors. You were doing the work of an evangelist. Right. But he's telling that to the pastor here, right? The man who's going to be the pastor of this church. To Timothy. He's telling Timothy, look, do the work of an evangelist. Don't be one of these pastors who just says, well, you go. I'm going to sit back and just, you tell me how it went when you get back. You know, to actually lead the charge. You know, make the maps. Hand them out. Tell people where they're going to go. Get out there with them. Get in the fields. Because there's plenty of pastors today that just want to sit back and let everybody else do it. But he's telling Timothy here to do the work. So we see, first of all, that those in ministry, they have to have the proper motives. 
and they have to meet the qualifications, right? He starts out saying, look, if you desire it, that's great. You desire a good work, though. And it's great if you desire it, but now if you desire it, you have to make sure you meet these qualifications. Now we have to go through this list and go and start checking these things off and making sure that we line up. And a lot of people, and I want to just say this before we get into these qualifications, because a lot of people get this idea sometimes that, well, those qualifications are just for the pastor. That they don't really apply to anybody else in, in the church. But, but why are the qualifications given to the pastor? Because, it's, look there in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 3. Neither is being lords over God's heritage, but being in samples to the flock. You know why the pastor has to meet all those qualifications? To be an ensample to the flock. You know, that he is to be... He is to be an example of the believers. Not an example to the believers, but an example of the believers. To show them how to live the Christian life. So that they'll do it as well. You know, so we're going to look at these qualifications, but every single one of these qualifications we can apply to everybody in the church. In one way or another. These all apply to all of us. You know, but here's the thing. Do you have to meet all these qualifications to come to church? I mean, there's a few we're going to see that if you're not meeting it, you know, <laughs> you're, you're to be, 1 Corinthians 5 says you are to be removed from the fellowship, put out. But do you have to meet all these qualifications of 1 Timothy 3 to just come to church and, 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 and warm a seat? No, you don't. You do have to meet them to be, be the pastor, to be the deacon. Yes, these must be there. But why is that? Because they are to be an example. Because they are to be a, a, an example of the believers or to the believers. So all of these qualifications that we look at, they, should, they can and should be applied to us. You know, even if we say, well, I'm never going to be a pastor, I'm never going to be a deacon, I'm never going to try and do this. You know, you should still try to measure up to this. One, you never know. You're might, you, might, you're, you, you don't know what's going to happen in 10 years. Right. You know, maybe one day you will want to be. You know, so make sure you're, you know, but in, in any case, it's not going to hurt to do these. Right. You know, and we're going to actually show you in Scripture where it, the same command is given to you. <coughs> so, they are, they, are, they are for everyone, but they are es essential to those that would be in leadership. So it says there in verse 2 of 1 Timothy 3, A bishop then must be blameless, the husband of one wife, vigilant, sober, of good behavior, given to hospitality, apt to teach. So he starts out there with, the, what's the first one we see? Blameless. Now a lot of people get confused about this one. It does not say sinless. It does not say perfect. It does not say having never uh, lived a wicked life. It just says blameless. You know, uh, meaning this, that it's not somebody, that, that there's not going to be anything that the world can point at now and say, oh, well, he's, yeah, he's a pastor, but he's also, you know, a shady businessman on the side. Yeah, he's also a pastor, but he's also committing adultery. Yeah, he's a, he's, he's a pastor, but all these, whatever, X, Y, Z. There's something that someone could point to and say, yeah, but he's also violating scripture. You know, he's not, to be, he's to be blameless, not perfect, but not guilty of a major sin, Right. And that the world, you know, that, the, that would violate commandments. It reminded me of, of Luke. You know, to turn there. Actually, go to Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2. I'll show you in Philippians chapter 2. We're not as only the, 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 that, I, uh, that the deacon or the pastor is to be blameless. But you know what? We're all supposed to be blameless. But it, it says in Luke 1, uh, There was in the days of Herod, the king of Judea, a certain priest named Zacchaeus. Right? This is John the Baptist's dad. Uh, of the course of Abiah. And his wife was the daughters of Aaron. Her name was Elizabeth, and they were both what? Righteous before God, walking in all the commandments and the ordinances of the Lord, blameless. Now, did it say they were sinless, perfect people that never committed sin? No. It said they were blameless because why? Because they were righteous before God. And what were they doing? Walking in all the commandments and the ordinances. Now, of course, they were observing a lot of ordinances that are done away in Christ, but we can apply that to us today. How can we be blameless like they are? By Doing what? By being righteous before God. You know, living a clean, godly life. That'll help you keep you blameless. And walking in all the commandments. You know, observing the things that we ought to do. Being a disciple. You know, if you love me, keep my commandments, Jesus said. So you're there in Philippians chapter 2, look at verse 14. Look, do all things without murmurings and disputings, that ye be blameless and harmless, the sons of God, without rebuke. So is that just for the pastor? That's for all of us. You know, yeah, it's essential for the pastor to be blameless, but it goes for all of us that we should all try and strive to live a blameless life without rebuke in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation among whom you shine as lights in the world. So that's a whole other top. That, I mean, every one of these could be a, a full sermon. He goes on, though, in the, uh, in the qualifications here of 1 Timothy. He says, a bishop that must be blameless, what? The husband of one wife. Now, that doesn't mean the husband of one wife at a time. 
right? We should understand that. You say, well, that seems obvious. Yeah, but there's people that exploit that. Even Baptists that will say, well, he's, you know, it just means if he's been divorced, you know, he, he, it's okay if a pastor gets divorced and gets remarried. That's not, that's not true. It's one wife, having been the husband of one wife. Meaning being married and never have been divorced. Now, so if you've been divorced, you know, sorry, you can't be the pastor. You can't be the deacon. Does that mean God can't use you? Does that mean you can't, uh, does that mean you shouldn't bother with the rest of these qualifications? No, not at all. These still apply to you. You should still try to achieve this. Because you could still do the work of an evangelist. And that's some of the, the, probably the most important work that any of us do. I mean, that's the ends of, that, that's the, that's the end of the means. You know, the church and the preaching of the word of God and having a pastor and having a deacon and, and the admonishing and everything that takes place, that's all so that we can accomplish the work of the evangelist. So just because you don't, you can't, you've been disqualified on any one of these points, don't, don't throw your hands up and say, well, I can't do anything great for God. You can still do great things for God without having to get up behind a pulpit and preach. <clears throat> so that's, you know, divorce is a sin that's to be avoided. Well, that's just for the pastor, though, right? It's just for the pastor. If you want to be a pastor or a deacon, yeah, you can't be divorced. No, I mean, the Bible's real clear. I mean, Matthew chapter 19, right? We, know, we should know these verses. Whosoever shall put away his wife, except it be for fornication, and shall marry another, committeth adultery. I mean, there, there's no, God, you know, God said, you know, what man, what God hath joined together, let not man put asunder. So that goes for all of us. It's not, you see how these qualifications aren't just for the man behind the pulpit? That they go for all of us? So it goes on there. He says, vigilant, right? He must be blameless, the husband of one wife. Vigilant. And what is vigilant? You know, it's being alert to the enemy. You know, it's looking for trouble, right? Now, it's not going looking for trouble, okay? But it's, it's being aware of trouble, the potential for it. And guarding the flock oh, as an overseer, watching it, protecting it, being vigilant. And we won't spend a lot of time on that one but it goes because there's a lot to get there he says sober right now sober kind of has kind of different meanings today kind of different connotations now one thing it means is serious being and i think that's the primary application there it's to be a serious individual not saying you never laugh not saying you don't know how to tell a joke or get a joke or don't have a sense of humor you know it, 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 but it does mean when it's time to be serious you get serious i mean living the christian life it's it's serious work that we're involved in right. So I believe that, you know, and that would, that, well, well, I think it means to not take drugs and alcohol. Well, you're not, t you're not a very serious person if you're taking drugs and alcohol, right? right? You're not sober. So you can see how they both kind of mean the same thing. You know, go, go talk to the stoner, you know, and, and watch him giggle at the dumbest things, you know. They're not sober because they're, they're ingesting, you know, the, you know, drugs, and they're not sober because they don't take anything seriously. So you see how that kind of works both ways? Yeah, of course, if, if we're taking drugs and alcohol, we're not sober, right? But also, it also means we should, we should be serious people. You know, if you're going to be the pastor, you've got to be a serious guy. I mean, you're dealing with people's lives. Right. You, can't, you can't be flippant with that. Uh, you're preaching the Word of God. That's, that's a serious endeavor. And uh, so th that's why these, these uh, qualifications are there. He goes on and he says, of good behavior, you know, conducting ourselves in the proper manner. You know, not, not uh, doing, th and this kind of ties in with being blameless, that kind of thing. And he goes on and says, uh, given to hospitality, right? Now, this is one that's kind of changed today. This is one that's less applicable today. But you have to remember back in the day when this was written, like being hospitable was a big thing. Because, you know, the Super 8 wasn't down the corner. I mean, go down to the IHOP and walk behind there. There's three hotels sitting right there. And there's four more right down the road. I mean, there's just hotels everywhere today. It's really easy to just go get a room somewhere, you know. But back in the day, it used to be that there wasn't any of that. And where people were traveling, they would rely on others to provide. I mean, we see it all the time in the Old Testament, right? Where people come into a strange town and they ha they, they, people bring them in or, 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 or they say, don't abide in the streets, right? Come in, stay with me. That happens all the time because that's the way it was. There wasn't just, you know, the hojo around every corner. You had to go find uh, accommodations. So this really... Um, applied a lot more back then now it still applies today and there's certainly a, the spirit of hospitality that we should all endeavor to have you know this we could apply this to ourselves you know within the local churches like when a when a visitor comes in where everyone doesn't just stop talking and, and turn and look right say that never happened i've had that happen and when i first started looking for a baptist church and i'm probably exaggerating this in my mind but this is how i recall it i was like well i got to go to a baptist church i went to a faith missionary baptist church 
and it was just a little church, but it had like the little steeple, and it was all white, and it had the steps that went up, and like the classic church look, you know. And I mean, I'm, I'm coming out of the world, I'm just in my jeans, probably a t-shirt or something, and I open this door, and it's just a bunch of gray heads, right, <laughs> all in their three-piece, and their Sunday best, and their doilies on their head, and they got the organ going. And I don't, think, I don't think they stopped playing the music. <laughs> I think the music continued to play, but it felt like it didn't. It felt like, you know, when someone walks in and the record goes, you know, like that. And, but, I, but about every head in that place just turned and went, you know, gave me that, that, that strained old, old man look. I'm like, who is this guy? And I stood there in the doorway. I'm not kidding. I opened the door and I stood there for a second. I watched all those heads turn and stare at me. And I went like this. <laughs> and I walked right back out. I said, that was intimidating. I was like, I'm not going in there. But, uh, you know, there wasn't a lot. It didn't seem very hospitable. You know, it, it looked a little dark and dank and, and uh, depressing, to be honest. The church, you know the church I ended up in for 11 years? I, I, I went to the door and I looked in the, and they were meeting in a UAW hall, okay, with little plastic folding chairs. And they had to go in there on, uh, on Sunday mornings and clean up the mess from the night before. It would smell like beer and cigarettes from the bingo or the, you know, the line dancing, whatever they were doing up there. But they rented that, they'd go in there and clean that thing out. So gravel parking lot wasn't the most attractive facility, but the preaching was good. I remember the first times I went there, I looked through that little glass, you know, the little bit of glass in that metal door. And it was Sunday school, and, and it was just the pastor and his kids, and I thought I was interrupting something. I thought they were doing schoolwork. I was like, well, I'll come back for the service. Well, the pastor had noticed me, and I'm walking back to my car. He comes running out of the door. Hey, how you doing? Shaking my hand. You coming back? You sure? You sure you're coming back? really wanted me to come back. I came back, you know, but there was a big difference between that church and the first one, right? What was the difference? I felt like somebody wanted me there. That, I felt like they were being hospitable. That's something we should try to do here. That's a spirit that we should try to have. Like we're actually glad when people come here. You know, I'm glad when a, when a visitor shows up. You know, I'm glad when regulars show up. You know, and let's not take each other for granted either. Let's always try to, you know, shake each other's hands and say hello and, and be civil and be polite and and I'm not saying everyone's got to be best friends, but can we at least get along and be civil? Should be able to do that. And we should be able to show some hospitality to those that would come in and visit us. So, of course, that's how it would apply today, being hospitable. Now, if needs be that I had to take somebody into my home and give them, uh, uh, or you as well, any of us would have to take somebody in and, and put them up for a night, we should be willing to do that. Right. But today we have the modern convenience of being able to just rent them a hotel room. And it's basically the same thing. And, you know, and this is kind of a preference thing. I actually prefer that. You know, I prefer if I were to go to another town than rather than to go stay in somebody else's house and walk on eggshells that they would just put me in a hotel room and, and let me just be my noisy self that I am. So, but that's, that's kind of how we would apply that day, being, being given to hospitality, providing accommodations in, for guests and those in need. And it says, you will say, well, that's just for the pastor. That's just for the, the deacon. That's just a qualification. Well, what's first, first Peter says, using hospita use hospitality one to another without grudging. That's to everybody, right? So again, these qualifications are for all of us. He goes on, it says there, uh, being blameless, husband and wife, vigilant, sober, of good behavior, given hospitality. What's the last one in that verse? Apt to teach. So <coughs> now this is kind of twofold. You know, he, one, obviously you got to know what you're talking about. you got to have know the Bible well enough to get up and actually preach it, right? Yeah. But then there's also the having the aptitude to teach. And, you know, a lot of people will have a lot of head knowledge. And I I've, I've know guys that know the Bible very well, but they don't have an ability to get up and teach it. You know, what makes some of the, the think of some of our, our favorite preachers, what makes some of, you know, I think of Pastor Anderson, and I've even heard him say this, and I, I found this to be very true. One of his great strengths as a preacher is to take that which is very complicated and make it very easy to understand. I mean, take the book of Daniel or Ezekiel or some comp, you know, deep passage. Or, I'm not saying he's got it all down. He'd, he'd admit that too. But I mean, he can take some deep, hard doctrine and deliver it to people in such a way that we can get it and understand it. Why is that? Because he's apt to teach. He doesn't just have the knowledge. He has an ability to do that. Not everybody has that. You know, some people get up behind a pulpit and just, they would just be, you know, wouldn't be able to get it out. You know, they would just want to get out of there as quick as they can. But, you know, we had a, so we have to have some teaching ability, some preaching ability to be able to get up and do that. Obviously, that, that should go without saying, but there it is. <coughs> you say, well, again, that's just, you know, teaching, that's just for the pastor. He's the only one to do that, right? Well, let's not forget the Great Commission. Go ye into all the world and do what? Teach all nations. So, again, that's a qualification that you've got to meet to some degree in your life, too. 
We all should be able to at least go and teach somebody the gospel at the door. You know, and, it, and it's amazing. I know people who are very men of few words, very quiet, don't say much at all. But you get those people, you go out soul winning at those same people, and they start preaching the gospel somebody, it's like they become another man. Why? Because they have at least that developed that much of an aptitude to teach. There's a big difference between standing up in front of a room of people and rather just talking to somebody one on one. Right? So even a person who's very introverted and very shy can at least learn to go out and teach to talk to somebody one on one and just have a conversation and teach them the gospel. So, you know, we should all be able to teach, to have some aptitude to teach. Obviously, if you're being the pastor, you're being you know, you're being a preacher, you have to have a little bit more than just the average. You've got to be able to actually fulfill the, the role. Uh, moving on there to verse 3. It says, Not given to wine, no striker, not greedy of filthy lucre, but patient, not a brawler, not covetous. So there's a whole other list, right? What does he say? Not given to wine. Which means this, you can't be a drunk and be a pastor. Okay? And you say, well, does that go on? Yeah, there's pastors that drink. Or they say, drinking's okay. And here's, here's, here's how people, they'll twist this some, sometimes. It says, well, he says, not given to wine. Right? Not given to wine. I mean, it's okay to drink wine. You just can't be given to it. But that's not... What you're doing, when you're saying... You're, they're saying, well, you know, so that just shows us that social drinking or just moderate drinking, but that's okay because we're not... If we're, if we're just socially drinking, if we're just moderately drinking, you know, then we're not given to wine. You know? And I will say there's a difference between being a drunk and being somebody who has a six-pack in his fridge. But you can't use that kind of logic here. Because it falls apart. What that is called is a, a, an argument from silence. Is everyone aware of you know, how that works? The logical fallacies, that's one of them. Yes. You know, by, you're, you're basing your argument on what it isn't saying. Right. Well, it says to not be given to wine. It doesn't say don't drink wine. That's, that's, a, that's a logical fallacy. Right. Does God have to spell it all out for us? And let's, let's apply that to another passage that deals with wine. Go ahead and turn over to Proverbs 23. Take that same kind of mentality. Well, it doesn't say... Not to drink, it just says don't be given to it. See? So obviously a little drinking here and there, that's okay. Right? Because it doesn't say not to drink. So you were basing our argument on what the Bible doesn't say and not just you know, applying what it does say. Well, look here in Proverbs 23, apply that same logic. Look not thou upon the wine when it is red, when it giveth it color in the cup, when it moveth itself aright. See? It doesn't say don't drink it, it just says don't look at it. So it's okay to drink as long as I don't look at it. Do you really want to go grab a bottle of red wine on your nice new carpet and try to pour a glass without looking at it? Right. <laughs> I mean, okay, as long as, I guess if you can get to the store, get to the liquor aisle with a, a blindfold on, purchase it, get all the way through the line, pay for it, get all the way home, pour a glass and get it to your lips without ever looking at it, then it's okay to drink. So that sounds ridiculous. That's the same logic. Well, it doesn't say don't drink it. It just says don't look at it. Hmm. I mean, okay, I guess it's okay to drink as long as you don't look at it then. That's how, it, well, that's preposterous. Yeah, it is. It's stupid. Because that's what an argument from silence is. It's dumb. It doesn't make any sense. It's a logical fallacy. Right. It's an error. <coughs> you know, we should not look at it. We shouldn't uh, go near it. And it certainly shouldn't be touching our lips ever. In any instance, I don't care how frequent or infrequent, it should not happen. Right. <coughs> so, I mean, that's, what, that's a sin in 1 Corinthians 5 that people get kicked out for, being a drunk. Right. Now, I'm not saying every, you know, if you're waking up and drinking, you're a drunk. If you've got to drink every day, you're a drunk, right? But I'm not saying that you can, as long as you're not doing that, that it's okay to, to drink. You know, you shouldn't be drinking at all. You shouldn't go there. Because here's the thing, most people aren't, aren't, People that say, well, I'm a moderate drunk. You know, I just have a glass of wine with dinner. Well, there's more glass, there's more alcohol in a glass of wine than a couple beers. Right. I mean, that's the hard stuff, you know? And, you know, we, I really don't, I want to spend a lot of time on this. This is a sermon I, I've preached on before, but, uh, you know, it does, drunks are not allowed to attend church. Okay, they're to be kicked out. So they'll quit drinking. And here's the thing. You say, well, I'm just a moderate drinker. For now, every drunk starts out taking a sip. Every drunk starts out just having their first. I remember my first beer. You know, I was about that tall. <laughs> you know, got a taste for it real young. Didn't get drunk right away. 
You know, but it develops, it grows, and it turns into you being a drunk. And I don't know a lot of people that can just, you know, well, I can handle my liquor, I don't drink that much. Well, maybe you just built up a tolerance, right. you know, and that just speaks to the fact that, that you're, you're more of a drunk than maybe you think. So again, we've preached whole sermons on that. Probably should probably preach another one, you know, sometime around New Year's, right? When everyone's going to be going out and getting drunk. So it goes on and says there, he's not to be given to much wine, which means he's not to be, you know, drinking, you know, not to be given to much wine, but probably would just be safe to not drink at all. Right? Safe to say that. He can drink as long as he's not looking at it. <laughs> not, not, uh, it goes on, there's no striker, right? But a grappler, no? right? It's the classic, the classic battle of the ages goes on, even in scripture. Grappler versus striker, right? Well, the scripture says not a striker. Always go with the grappler, right? <laughs> God, I mean, God wrestled, right? You can go back, you know, you can wrestle Jacob, right? <laughs> So, not a striker. The Lord was not a striker. He was a grappler. But he said, what is he saying here? Not about being a striker. You know, not being somebody who's going to, you know, it, it kind of says it repeats it again, not being a brawler. You know, not a striker, not someone who's probably just quick to, to throw a fist. You know, someone who just can't keep their cool. You know, someone who can't just keep their physical, and you know, this, this can be a real challenge for some people. You know, an anger problem. I, this is something that we have to work on and not being physically violent. I mean, some people, they just fly off the handle and, and, and they're out there. So that's a pretty straightforward one. I think we can all understand that. And you say, well, again, that's just, that's just for the pastor. I can go punch whoever I want. Anytime they, you know, they didn't use their left hand turn signal, I'm going to run them down. She cut in front of me in the grocery line or uh, whatever, you know. Uh, so now they're going to get it, Right? That's for the pastor. I can, I can hit whoever I want. Well, the Bible says in Hebrews 12, follow peace with all men, right? Follow peace. Now, are you following peace if you're out there, you know, letting them catch your hands, you know, giving them these hands? Is that what they say? <laughs> right? You're out there picking fights. You're not following peace with all men. So this, this isn't just for the pastor. You know, this is, this is for everybody, right? And he says, uh, not greeny of filthy lucre, Right? Again, going back to those motives, somebody who's not in it for financial gain. You know, preaching things that they ought not for, for filthy lucre's sake. So not being in it for money. Well, that's, that's, you know, that's for the pastor. He shouldn't just desire money. You know, he should, you know, he should, he should live like a pauper. He should just be poor. And I'm not, that, that's not what it's saying here. Right. You know, there's a big difference you know, you know, uh, between being, uh, ex having an exorbitant lifestyle and, and, and just living a, a, a moderate life, you know, with decent things. You know, not design, you don't have to have the best of everything, but that doesn't mean you have to go live in the dirt either, right? You know, give me poverty nor riches. You know, feed me with food convenient for me, as the scripture says. So he's not greedy of filthy lucre. Is that just for the pastor? Well, if you're there in First Timothy, if you, I can read to you from chapter 6, verse 9. Kind of getting ahead of myself here in a few weeks, but it says, "But they that will be rich will be rich, not are rich." You know, there's commandments later in there to those that are already rich, but here he's saying to those that will be rich, those that are going to make their life all about money, and seeing how much money they can make. You know, and the, there's a, some strong warnings about that in Scripture. They that will be rich fall into a snare and to many foolish and hurtful lusts, which drown men in destruction and perdition. That's a strong warning. Because here's the thing, there's a lot of things we will never get into because we can't afford it. And when you have a lot of money and you get a lot of crowd, you get a certain crowd around you, you get a lot of yes men, and they start introducing you to different people who can get you into different things. I mean, money can take you down a dark road. So that goes for everybody. He goes on and says that the, he has to be patient, but patient, not a striker, you know, not given to wine, not a striker, not greedy of the lucre, but patient. And what does he mean by that? You know, not just not, you know, wearing a smile on his face when he's in the DMV, you know, the whole, for three hours. Just <laughs> I'm patient, you know. It's more than that. A patient meaning long-suffering. You know, if you're going to be a pastor and you're going to be dealing with people, you have to learn to be patient. Because people have problems, people have issues, people have conflicts, people are, have sins, people are, are in different places in their life. And, and, and pastors, they have to be long-suffering with those people. You know, they can't just start trying to shove everybody around and, and, and push people faster than they're uh, uh, able to go. And really what it is is putting up with others. 
you know, putting up with the things that, that come along with dealing with people. Now, that goes for all of us, right? Do we not all have relationships where we have to exercise some patience with, with people? Right? You know, any of the, the moms in the room, right? They're, they're doing this every day, right? Because they're married. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> that too, I suppose that would apply. But it goes for everybody, right? The Bible says uh, in James, be patient, therefore, brethren. He didn't say be patient, therefore, pastors. Be patient, therefore, brethren, of the coming of the Lord. He said in James 1, My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptation, knowing that the trying of your faith worketh patience. So when we're being tried, you know, we should allow patience to work. And let patience have her perfect work, that ye may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. So patience is something we have to have with everybody. It goes for all of us. It's not just for the man behind the pulpit. And it goes on and says they're patient, not a brawler. Right? So these are all just these qualifications. There's a lot that you have to, to check off to, to, to get to that office. Right. Not a brawler. You know, we say, well, what's the difference between that and a striker? Well, I think the difference is that a striker is somebody who just wasn't looking for a fight, but it, it gets into one easy. Kind of a hothead. You know, somebody honks the horn at the crosswalk and he turns and spits in the, in the windshield and chases you down, you know, uh, four lanes of traffic on a rush hour in Phoenix. I've seen that. Had it happen, right? I've told that story. That guy's a hothead. That guy's a striker. You know, not a brawler. You know, the guy that's going to go out to the bar and get drunk and just pick a fight with whoever because he just feels like it. A lot of guys like that. You know, they just, that's their thing. Some guys are just, they're into different things. Some guys just like to go out and fight. Drunk or not, bar or not, they just want to go pick a fight with somebody. At the drop of a hat, they're really just, that's their thing. That's what, you know, gets their, gets their motor going. They're a brawler, right? They want to go out and fight people. You can't be that if you're going to be a pastor. And, you know, got, and the thing is, you kind of see how these all tie together, not being a brawler, being patient, long-suffering, not being a striker. And you can't let people goad you into throwing a punch or getting into some physical altercation, as, as, especially as a pastor. You know, because that would make you, you know, it's not, a, it's not the example that we're to be setting. I've, now, thankfully, I've never had to put up with that. I've never had anybody be a, so offended at me at the door about soul winning or preaching or anything like that where they've actually wanted to try to goad me into some physical altercation. And, but I've known others who have. You know, they've had to deal with that. They've had to have deal with people wanting to come down and, and get physical, you know. And y you say, well, where do you does that mean I'm just supposed to sit back and let them just sock me in the face and just take it? No, I mean, obviously, I'm not saying you shouldn't be able to defend yourself. We should all be willing to, but we all have to decide where that line is. You know, are you going to put, are you going to start throwing punches just because somebody shoved you in the chest and called you a dirty name or spat at you or, or whatever? You know, took your Bible and threw it in the bush. Now you're just, you know, you're ready to throw down. Or, I mean, I'm not. I don't, I don't think, I think it's, I think there's a lot of t opportunity for you to de-escalate de the situation and walk away. Now, if somebody's coming after me, Meaning to do me physical harm, you know, and, and they they're they're swinging. I mean, their fists are their fists are clenched, and I know that you know. Okay, then it's on. Then then I'm going to do whatever I have to do to defend myself. But I'm not going to go around instigating that or making that happen, you know, because I'm not a brawler. I don't I don't like fighting. You know, I don't want to get in a fight. I've been in very few fights, and there was a long time ago, and they didn't last that long. Not because you know. <laughs> that but because somebody broke it up really fast you know I've probably fought with my sister more than anybody <laughs> you know what I mean but I saw I saw my dad get in, into these fights and come home the next day all battered and I'm like what? that doesn't look like fun to me you know I don't I don't understand you know now I can see where people now again let me just clarify if a person wants to engage in a sport like boxing or MMA that's different right. that's you know they can you can be a striker then you know you know, just make sure your ground game is up to par too. <laughs> you can go ahead and do that, because that's a that's a where we're consenting. Right. You know, where it's a sporting match. Right. You know, where there's a referee involved. You know, it's it's there's a purpose behind it, not just to let off some steam. You know, by beating up somebody who's smaller than me or something like that. So I think we get the point on that. So he goes on and says, not a brawler. He says, not covetous, right? And that's an important one too. That. And again, I, that should pretty much go without saying that applies to all of us. I mean, do I have to turn us back to the Ten Commandments? Thou shalt not covet, you know. <laughs> Thou shalt not desire thy neighbor's wife, neither shalt thou covet thy neighbor's house, his field, his manservant, his maidservant, his ox, his ass, 
or anything that is thy neighbor's. You know, that goes for all of us. And, you know, it says in Ephesians 5, but fornication and uncleanness and covetous or covetousness, let it not once be named among you. That would include me. That would include all of you. Everybody. As become a saint. So I don't think we need to go into depth here on what covetous is. Desiring things that don't belong to you. You know, and that because then you get into that whole desiring uh, you know, filthy lucre. And you start coveting things. And then you start preaching, you know, heresy, just trying to build a crowd. Why? Because you... Because the pastor just starts to cover it a full offering plate or a bigger building. You know, or he, he's got to have some big house and the best car and a private plane. He's covetous, right? He goes on in verse 4 and says, One that ruleth well his own house, having his, what? Children in subjection with all gravity. The Bible's real clear here. It's plural for a reason. If God was okay with a person having just one child and being the pastor, it, it would not say children here. It would say child. That's right. I mean, and, you know, I'm, and I'm never going to go out of my way to disqualify somebody else's. And this, and this is something we all have to be careful of. Is that someone will see another a man who's in the role of, as a pastor, and maybe he doesn't meet this qualification or some other qualification, and then they take it upon themselves to go and disqualify that man. Well, here's the thing. Somebody else laid their hands on that man and said he was qualified. Okay? And it's not our, position, our job to go out and regulate everybody else's pastor and whether or not they're qualified. You see what I'm saying? We can't, we, and I, people do this. They'll learn about some pastor on the other side of the country over the internet. Then they'll get online and say, oh, I don't think you're qualified. And you know what? Maybe he doesn't meet all these qualifications, but it's too late. Somebody already laid his hands on him. And I've had people ask me too, like, hey, what do you do if your pastor, uh, you know, is married to a divorced woman? He's not divorced, but he married someone that's divorced. You know, and it's like, well, do you want me to, you know, who made me a judge in these matters? You know, if you're that worried about it, move and go to a better church where you think the pastor is qualified. If that's the best you got in town, I'd go there and hold my nose and get over it and just go to church and be a blessing. <laughs> but it does say having his children in subjection with all gravity. You know, having his children in order, in subjection, meaning when he doesn't have to there and say, count down from 10, you know, get them to get them to do what they need to do. You know, put, you know, whatever it is they ask them to do. They're in subjection. With what? With all gravity. That's like seriousness, right? <clears throat> so having his children, more than one. Why? For, verse 5, For if a man not know how to rule his own house, how shall he take care of the church of God? He's saying, look, if you can't even run your own house, what in the world makes things? If you can't get your sweet little darling children who adore you to follow you and do what you say, what makes you think you're going to get some grown, hair-legged man right. to listen to what you have to say? I mean, men are not, by nature, followers. We're leaders. Right. So it, you have to have some ability to, to command that respect in the house of God to where a man would say, you know what, I can at least follow that guy. But, and if, I look, but if you look at me and all my kids were over here just you know, coloring on the chairs and, and tearing pages out of the Bible while I'm preaching and not listening to me, It'd probably be, I think I would probably discredit myself. Right. Even if all my doctrine was right. right. Even if, big if here, my preaching was decent. Right? <laughs> Even if I was a good preacher. You guys would probably look at my kids and be like, well, I can't follow that guy. Look at his kids. They're, they're a mess. You know, they got st st suckers stuck in their hair and clothes on backwards. And they won't do anything he says. Right? How shall he take care of the church of God if he can't rule his own house? Right. And it's plural for a reason, children, because there's a big difference between raising one child and raising two. And there's a big difference between raising two and raising three. And from what I found recently, there's a big difference between three and four. Now, I've been told four is like the threshold, right? Everyone thinks, how do you take care of so many kids? How do you do it? Pastor Anders, I remember asking that. How do you, how do you have eight or nine, at the time you think you had eight or nine kids. I'm like, how do you do that? And he said, well, actually, it's harder to raise four children than it is to raise eight. And he had explained to me that, you know, once they get to a certain age, they actually become an asset. You know, we've got, them, we've got one that's finally, you know, Karen's kind of an asset now. And Linda, too. They can do things. But up until that point, like, it's all on mom and dad. It's mostly mom, by the way. You know, it's all on her to, like, get a lot of this done. And it's three people, right, that are completely incapable of taking care of themselves, practically. Right. You know, it's a big day when the, the kid can put his own clothes on. 
you know, or, or, or take himself to the bathroom, right? So that's why it's children, because raising one is one thing. I'm not saying it's e the easiest thing in the world, but it's nowhere near as hard as raising four. And I think it's children because that puts pressure on people. That puts, that's more pressure on a family and an individual to see if they really have it, you know, to see if they really have what it takes to rule well. I mean, if all I had to do was worry about keeping one kid in line, that's a little bit easier than trying to keep two or three or four or however many. So <laughs> anyway, th uh, we'll move on here. It says, uh, uh, you know, and you say, well, that's, that's for the pastor. Well, again, you know, Colossians, fathers provoke not your children to anger, lest they be discouraged. You know, you have to be a good father out there too. Amen. You have to be a good parent too. Ye fathers provoke not your children unto wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and admission of the Lord. You know, you need to rule your house well too. It's not just for the, the pastor. And he goes on in verse 6 and he says, Not a novice, lest being lifted up with pride, he fall in the condemnation of the devil. So what is the condemnation of the devil? What was he condemned for? Pride. Right? That was his condemnation. He was lifted up. Right? That's the warning here. That's why you don't have a novice. Because that what can happen is, often, is that they become lifted up with pride. Right? And they fall into his condemnation. They're condemned in the same way the devil is condemned. I'm not saying that they lose their salvation. I mean, I'm saying they face that same condemnation, that judgment of, of being proud. So what is a novice, right? Now, novice simply just means new. You know, somebody who is new to the faith. That's not who you want as the pastor. That's not who you're going to put behind the pulpit and lead a church. Because you don't know how that person is going to turn out. You know, and I, and I think this is true. And I'm not saying that this is the minimum for getting behind the pulpit or anything or being a pastor. But the first two years, you know, when people get in a church and get serious about that first two years, it's kind of like the honeymoon, right? And maybe even shorter sometimes. But after that, you know, then, then the Christian life gets real. And it's not, you know, the Christian life is not measured in years. It's, me it, it's measured in decades. You know, it's not measured, well, I, you know, I've been doing it for three or four years. Okay, well, let's, let's go for another 10 or 20 and see how it's going. Because that, that's what we want. We want to be in this thing for the long haul. So you have to wait on somebody to say, well, they've been at this long enough. They've been through some things. I know they're not a quitter. They're not someone the next time some little hiccup comes up that they're just out. You know, persecution comes, they're not just going to flee. They've been through some, they've been through some of the ups and lows of the Christian life. They've been in it long enough to, to ride the roller coaster more than once. And they know uh, what to expect. <clears throat> you know, they, they have to be someone who doesn't just have a head knowledge. You know, it's one thing to just have all the knowledge. It's another thing to actually apply that knowledge. You know, understand, it's one thing to know what the Bible says and to understand what it says. It's another thing to actually apply that. Not just in your own life, but when as a pastor and in situations, in relationships, in, 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 in all kinds of things, in different situations where sin's involved, heresies involved, you have to know how to handle all those things as a pastor. You know, and you don't, you don't learn. That's not something you want to get on the job. You know, I, and I've, I've learned from these situations. Why? Not because I was a pastor when it was going on, because I was in the pew. I was in the thick of it. You know, I'm, I'm there watching and learning how a pastor handles it when someone brings a heresy into a church. I'm sitting back and watching how a pastor handles it when somebody gets kicked out for being a drunk or being a fornicator or whatever it is. I'm sitting there watching how a pastor handles it when that same person comes back and has gotten right with God. You know, that's how you learn these things. And you can't learn that being new to the faith. You can't learn that in a week. You can't learn that in a year. You have to sit there and watch these things happen and, and grow in them and understand and take them in so that when you get there, when you gain that experience, now you know, now you've already learned. You're not a novice. So, because here's the thing. What is it? When people are exalted, you know, he says he's being lifted up with pride, right? He's being lifted up. Not a novice. He's being lifted up. They become exalted too quickly. They become prideful. That's what happens. And here, and here, this is really the, the, the crux of it, is that wh why is it that we should take time and before we put somebody behind the pulpit as a pastor or a deacon? It's because good leaders, people who lead well, learn how to follow well. You'll never be a good leader if you never learn how to be a follower. And that you see that principle in Scripture. Take jo Joshua is the perfect example of that. What was the, the first time, and we're gonna st I want to do a, a series of Joshua here in a little bit and go back and try it again because I just think it's such a great <laughs> example that we can all learn so much from. The first time we see Joshua, he is called Moses' servant. 
He's not, he's not referenced as the guy that went in and took over the promised land and slayed seven kings in one day and caused the sun to stand still. Right. He was a servant. And you see that all through. I mean, you see that in Timothy. Timothy was found of Paul uh, with having a good report of the brethren. He was already in the church. He was already serving. He was already faithful when Paul came along. Paul didn't just pull him off the street and say, hey, I'm going to make you my protege. He was already a follower. He was already somebody that was faithful. And he brought him along and brought him up. So good leaders are good followers. That's why you can't be a novice. Because you haven't had time to follow. And, and that's where, where the rubber meets the road. If, if you can follow, then you learn what it is to lead. <coughs> and there's, you know, there's more there, but I've had you guys here for a while, so let's just move along here. But it says, um, verse 7, Moreover, you must have a good report of them which are without. Now that ties in with blameless, doesn't it? You know, them that are without, talking about those that are outside the church. You have to have a good report. You can't have these glaring faults in your life. You can't be a, you know, a shady businessman or whatever. You have to have a good report. You can't be preaching on, on Sunday in, in, in the casino on Monday. Right. Right? That doesn't fly. <coughs> Lest he fall into reproach and the snare of the devil. Boy, have we seen that happen over and over again. That happens. Guys get in the pulpit. You know, they, they, and they end up falling into reproach and the snare of the devil. And by the way, when the, them that are without, they're merciless. They're not going to just say, well, we understand. They're, they're going to crucify you as a pastor. The world hates God's people. They hate the preaching of the word of God. And they love nothing more than when a man of God falls. And they have no problem broadcasting it to the world and reminding you every time they get an opportunity of how some man of God fell. Right? They fall into reproach. That's not what we want. We don't want our name to be a name that re of reproach. So we need to be blameless. He says there in verse 8, likewise, meaning in the same manner, meaning everything that was just discussed about the pastor applies here too to the deacon. Likewise must the deacons be grave. Same thing as being sober. Not double-tongued, not given to much wine. Not greedy of filthy lucre. Not double-tongued. What does that mean? It means he's not the type of guy that's just going to tell everybody what they want to hear. You know, he's going to tell, tell this person whatever they want to hear and tell that person whatever they want to hear. You know, he's, he's going to be consistent in his speech. <clears throat> uh, not double-tongued. And what does it go on and say? They're holding the mystery of the faith in a pure conscience. And let these also first be proved, and then let them use the office of a deacon, being found blameless. blameless. So again, there's that concept of somebody being found, right? Having all, not, not, let it give him the office of deacon and see how he does. See if he, if he meets these qualifications. No, he is to first be proved, right? And to be found blameless. You know, let him be tested first. You know, the, deacon, the deacons are, are not going to be people that we, again, just, we're not going to put an ad in Craigslist hiring deacon and see who shows up. You know, it's going to be people that have been, have been observed, people that have been in the church for a while, people that have meet these qualifications. All the ones that have meet for the pastor are, meet, are, are the ones that are applied to the deacon as well. And this likewise, right? Being found, already having been proven and found faithful as what? as a layman, as somebody is in, that's already in the pew. That's where you're going to be found faithful. That's where you're going to be proved, is out there, not up here. <laughs> he says, uh, verse 11, even so must their wives be grave. See how that keeps coming up? <laughs> grave, sober, serious. Uh, not slanderers, sober, faithful in all things. You know, that one, not slander, slanderers, that's important. And that's a big one. You know, I could tell you about a pastor's wife who turned into a slanderer for whatever reason. She had her reasons. But that, I'm telling you, they can, they can destroy a church with that. I've seen that happen. Run people out of churches. They just get a bad feeling. They just want to do, do harm for whatever reason. And they just start slandering. You know, and if a pastor or a deacon has a wife that's a slanderer, he should step down. Period. Because it says not slanderers. And what is a slanderer? It's somebody who's bringing unfounded accusations against other people. That's what slander is. It says, speak that in Titus chapter 2, speak thou the things which become sound doctrine, that the aged men be sober, grave, temperate, sound in faith, and charity and patience. The aged women likewise, that they be in behavior as becometh holiness, not false accusers, not given to much wine, teacher of good things. That goes for everybody. You know, and, and it's 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 honing in here obviously in First Timothy on on the the, the wives of the deacon. 
or the, the deacon's wife, I should say, <laughs> not the wives of the deacon, the deacon's wife, right? But it goes for all of us. None of us should be slandering. We shouldn't be going out bringing these false accusations, okay? Uh, verse 12, he says, Let the deacons be the husband of one wife, husbands of one wife. We've gone over that, what that means, right? Ruling their children in their own house as well. Same qualifications. Boy, he sounds redundant. Well, maybe we should pay more attention to things that God emphasizes. If God's repeating something in the same chapter, he must think it's pretty important. It's like he's trying to get it through our heads that they have to be the husbands of one wife. You can't have been divorced. You have to have children, right? He, these are important. And we kind of take them for granted. Sometimes we don't think, you know, we think a lot of other things are much more important, but what is God's calling important here? And what is it that we so often see are the qualifications that aren't met? We see guys with one child. We see people that only have been divorced and remarried going into the ministry in these offices. So we see that the qualifications for the pastor and the deacon are the same. And we also see tonight, hopefully, that they apply to all of us. It's not just unique to, to the men behind the pulpit. It's, it's, it applies to everybody, uh, to some degree and another. And why is that? Why is it that it applies to all of us? Because where do you think pastors and deacons come from? They come from out there. So if you're, you can't just be like, well, I don't, none of that's going to apply to me. I'm going to do whatever I want, and then one day I'm going to be the deacon, or one day I'm going to be the pastor. You've got to learn all that out there. You have to be proved out there. You have to be found blameless out there. That's why these qualifications apply for the bishop and for the deacon, because they are to be in samples to the others, because it applies to all of us. Because they, you know, bishops and deacons, they come up from within the church. We don't just hire them. We don't, we don't outsource that. <coughs> I mean, will we say it's permissible for people to violate these, uh, these, these, uh, these qualifications prior to taking on the office of a bishop or a deacon? Well, it doesn't matter. He can, he can be a striker and a brawler and a drunk and divorced and remarried. He can just violate all these because, after all, he's not the bishop. He's not the deacon. doesn't apply. doesn't matter if his kids are running amok in the church and at home. doesn't matter. Will we say that? Will we say it's permissible just because they don't hold that office? The reason why they have that, these qualifications are there for the office is to be the example so that you wouldn't do that either. That's the whole point. You know, and here's the thing. It says there in verse 13, we'll close on this. For they that have used the office of a deacon well. Now, notice it doesn't say they that have used the office of a deacon. It says they have done it well, right? That means you can do a poor job at this. You can, you know, not just the deacon too. You can be a bad pastor. You can be a bad deacon. You can do a poor job at it. You cannot use it well. You know, ask my predecessor how that went for him. You know, it didn't turn out so hot for that guy. He didn't use it well. He used it to his own selfish ends. Right. And what is, so what is using the office of a deacon? Well, what does a deacon do? He waits on the daily ministration. He's a servant, right? He's not there to serve himself and see what he can get out of it. He's there to help others, to, to facilitate others. You know, one of the big things I do as a deacon is I lead soul winning trips on the Indian reservation. And sometimes I take over 30 people out there in several different vehicles for two days. And I ha it's up to me to house them, feed them, and keep them busy. That ain't easy. It's like herding cats sometimes. Right. <laughs> you know, so if, I, if you ever ever one of those trips and you just kind of see me doing this, you know, <laughs> that's why. <laughs> it's usually a pleasure though. I mean, and usually, and usually I'm, I'm way more stressed out than I need to be. I finally I get there and I'm like, this isn't that bad. It's all in your head. You make, you make it sound worse than it really is. But the point being, like, what, it, what am I doing that for? To help others go out and serve Christ. To see souls saved. To help other people. To, that's using the office well. You know, not just sitting back and, you know, my job is just to count the money and deposit the checks. You know, and, and just sit back and take it easy. Right? And write a sermon here and there. No, the deacon should be a busy guy. You know, he should be working in the church. He should be taking the load off the pastor. You know, and the pastor shouldn't have to sit there. I remember I got hired. His, his words to me were like, I don't want to hold your hand. And I said, I don't want you to hold my hand. <laughs> You know, he should be helping the pastor in that way, you know, helping the church to run and, 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 and facilitate that, the daily ministration, so that the pastor and others can, can focus on bigger things, you know, and, and focus on getting what they're trying to get done as well. But it does show us there that it is possible to do a poor job, right? 
And doing it well, if we do these things well, what does it bring? It brings a, uh, it says they purchase to themselves a good degree and great boldness in the faith, which is in Christ Jesus. So if we do do these jobs well, we get a good, we should have a good reputation. You know, and we should have a good standing and great boldness, you know. Uh, uh, and really, uh, I'm kind of out of time, I'm just going to wrap it up there. But really what it is, is that they become the examples of proper Christian conduct. That's why we should, uh, a, a, if, a, if a deacon does his job well, what he ends up doing, he doesn't just have a good name if, if, so that people can say, oh, what a great guy. It's so, they can, it's so that he can be an example to the believers, an example of how we should all live our lives as Christians, how we should all live our lives as servants, and, and that we should all endeavor to meet these qualifications. Whether we're going to be in the full-time ministry or not, these qualifications apply to all of us. And a, and a deacon that does his job well will show that. And he will, he will be an example of that to other people. And so will a pastor, too. So he wraps up there in verse 14. He says, These things write, I write unto thee, hoping to come unto thee shortly. Now, I love that he, he says look, that we realize here that Paul's not even present. You know, he's, he's just kind of trusting Timothy to do these things without him having to be there. And that's really, you know, the, uh, the, an example of a good pastor. You know, the pastor, when you think about it, at the end of the day, there's no one standing over him making sure he's doing a good job. And we're going to, you know, that's kind of getting into the, the, the Sunday morning sermon about pastoral authority, the two offices. But he's kind of his own thing. I mean, he's, he's his own man. You know, he's self-employed pretty much. But you know what? He has somebody else that's going to come to him shortly too, doesn't he? And somebody else is going to, he's going to give him an account one day. But he's, that's why it's important that they do their job well because they, they, and they have that understanding. The ones that are doing a good job, you know, they're not, they know they're not a, just a, 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 you know, a, a lone ranger. They're not just out there doing their own thing. They're doing everything under their, the, the, the over-shepherd, you know, the, the, the chief shepherd. He says, but if I tarry long, right, that thou mayest know how thou oughtest to behave thyself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth. So he says there, you ought to know how to behave yourself in the house of God. There is a way, that, you know what that tells me? There's a way to behave in church. And there's a way not to behave in church. And that, again, is a whole other sermon in and of itself. But we can all apply that to our, ourselves accordingly. You know, how is it that we ought to uh, behave in the house of God as a child, as an adult, as a mother, as a father, as a deacon, as a pastor, whatever role we have in life, you know, we should be behaving ourselves in the house of God. And, you know, and that's our conduct. How are we conducting ourselves in the church? That's really what it's referring to. Not just, you know, don't run. You know, no rough housing. That's part of it. But how, what is your behavior like? Right? There's a way to behave yourself. And we need to apply that to ourselves accordingly. And, 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 and you know, again, as I started out in the sermon, why all of this? Why all these qualifications? Why have these positions? Why have them have to have these, these uh, meet up to these, these uh, you know, these, these, these qualifications and these offices? Why do they have to be there? Why do we have to have them? Why do we have to have teachers and evangelists and pastors and deacons? And why do those guys have to meet up to, this, to, uh, to these requirements? Because of verse 16, And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh. Because Christ came and died for the church. Christ came and, and purchased us with his own blood. He was justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preached to the Gentiles, believed on the world, received up into glory, and one day he's coming back. And he's, you know, he's going to check out how things were done while he was gone. You know, he's, he, he's gone now. He's hoping to come unto us shortly, but if he tarry long, we ought, to, we ought to pay attention to this chapter and behave ourselves accordingly. Let's go ahead and pray.